Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. We continue our discussion on COVID-19. The number of confirmed cases has now passed almost 2.5 million globally. Over 170,000 people also died. Yet the WHO has warned that the worst is yet to come. Lately, we have talked to Martin Jacques, a senior fellow at the Department of Political Science and International Studies from Cambridge University. He's also author of the book, When China Rules the World. He gave his opinions on the performance of governments and governance around the world in coping with the challenges of COVID-19. Tell me more about your reaction to the U.S. decision to halt WHO funding. Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's not surprising because we know that Trump is capable not only of the unexpected, but in also, also in a sense, the predictable, because uh, his view of the world uh, is America first. And uh, so uh, he's not really bothered about other nations and what other nations uh, uh, need. He's just bothered, basically, at the end of the day, this is a decision based on his desire to win the next presidential election uh, in America. So it's a complete abdication of any kind of responsibility to the world. So uh, are we going to be, in a way, delayed as a result of the action from the U.S.? What does it depend on? The only way we're going to be able to deal with this successfully is by global cooperation, uh, not one nation on its own, but nations uh, together, because uh, we, we're not out of the woods yet in relationship to this. It could, uh, outbreaks could, uh, could go on, further outbreaks, second, third. You know, we don't know how uh, the, the virus might mutate over time. So it's absolutely vital uh, that we have uh, uh, collaboration. Now, the danger is that with, if America suspends its funding, it's a, a very significant funder of the WHO, then how is that going to be made good? But in a wider way, probably, uh, and there's optimistic noises coming from the WHO about how they're going to handle this uh, action by the Americans, but generally it creates an, an area of confusion, of conflict, of distraction, which prevents the world concentrating on what it needs to do. You know, there are two things that need to be done. One, countries need to concentrate on handling the outbreaks in their own territory, and secondly, cooperating and learning from each other. Mm -hmm. As clear as that, these are the priorities. These should be the most important tasks. How confident are you the next step? Well, I'm not so confident. I mean, I, I, I think we just have to be relatively pragmatic while also being thinking strategically about the future. But Pragmatically speaking, you know, countries are wrestling with uh, the spread. So, uh, I mean, it looks possibly as if Europe uh, is just uh, beginning to turn the corner. But don't let's get too optimistic about that. I mean, the, the worst cases have been Italy and Spain, uh, and uh, they seem to uh, maybe uh, peaked. Um, the UK situation is very serious, and of course the American situation, where, which is the worst in terms of the number of deaths, uh, is, uh, well, it, you know, the, the trouble in the American situation is not least. The polarization of American politics means uh, there's not been a proper concerted action. Uh, I mean, New, New York's been handled well uh, by Cuomo, relatively well, I think. Um, but, you know, Trump's always pulling in another direction, speaking to a different audience, the audience he thinks is going to elect him at the next uh, in the presidential election in, in November. So I think that uh, which, and the other thing that must be added here, uh, and I think this could be absolutely critical next question, which is what is going to happen to the developing countries? What's going to happen in, uh, in your, in, uh, you know, in East Asia, in, for example, in Indonesia, uh, in the Philippines? Uh, what's going to happen in uh, sub-Saharan Africa? Um, we are th these countries have got very weak uh, health facilities, uh, uh, very low proportion of doctors uh, per, uh, in, in the population. So th that that could be a big problem because then you get you know then you can have easily a feedback a kickback effect 
from the developing countries back into the relatively rich countries. So we, we, we don't know the end of it. The story is not finished. And we're seeing many of those cracks right now. The question really is, uh, uh, Mr. Jack, are our lives going to be sacrificed as a result of the U.S. presidential election? All of our lives. Well, uh, I think that Trump is really only interested in one thing, and that is his re-election. It shows you, you know, uh, Trump shows you how dangerous it is if you get a, the, the leader of the United States simply playing to a, a section of the American population which, with which uh, he has some kind of uh, affinity, some kind of resonance. And their interests and their prejudices are placed above those of the rest of the United States, which is at least half the United States, and the rest of the world. And that's the situation. That's the dilemma the world is faced with someone like Trump being the president of the United States. We have noticed that you've been observing very closely since the very beginning of the pandemic. I mean, COVID-19 being pronounced by the WHO as a pandemic. Uh, the governance style, quote unquote, of the East and the West. Tell me more about your uh, observation results. Well, I think there's there have been very marked differences, actually. Um, I mean, if you take East Asia, uh, by which I mean uh, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, South Korea, Singapore, and so on, um, uh, they they've all handled uh, the uh, virus pretty successfully, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, this is a completely new phenomenon. China always is confronted with uh, an unknown. It couldn't look elsewhere. It had to understand it itself and so on. And I think basically uh, they've acted uh, with uh, uh, very well in these countries uh, once they realized just what a great danger it was uh, with great effect. Uh, why? Uh, well, I think that's got culturally, uh, it's not just a political question, it's a cultural question as well. That's to do with this strong relationship uh, in Confucian style societies between the state and the individual. You know, the state and the individuals expect governments uh, in these countries to give a lead. They expect governments uh, to take the initiative. Uh, and they will respond and people will respond in a in a, in a, in, a, in a very uh, orderly and uh, um, and a solidaristic way. Now, in the in in Europe and the United States, I think it's much less uh, like that. It varies across uh, the, the different countries. They're not all the same, um, but the the tendency there has. I mean, this kind of uh, relationship between state and individual is much it's much more distant, and therefore. This, it's not just that individuals don't react in the same way, it's that the state is disinclined to intervene in this way. So, it, you know, if you look, if I look at my own country, really the idea of the lockdown was, you know, it was very, very slowly adopted uh, by the government. It was reluctant. It moved uh, uh, at a really relative to the, the urgency of the time in a snail-like way, a snail's pace uh, to react to the situation. So... I, I think that uh, certainly to deal with an epidemic of this kind, you know, by and large, I would say uh, countries like China, uh, Vietnam, uh, the ones I listed earlier, uh, have been able to deal with it much more effectively. And you can see that in the the death. I mean, the the figures for the numbers that have died uh, show that difference. Of course, the other the extreme on the Western side is the United States, um, where the attitude towards government in the United States is, uh, in the popular uh, view, is to keep it at arm's length, to keep it at bay. You know, the state is a problem. The state is an, even an adversary, an enemy. So therefore, to get effective action is much more difficult. And that is complicated by two other factors than that in the United States. One is the federal system. So there's the states on the one hand and the national government on the other. And the other problem is the deep polarization now in American politics, which really in some degree or, or another paralyzes uh, or, or greatly undermines the capacity to do things. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jack, uh, one of the things we're talking about is we have to understand pandemic. Pandemic is something that you have to react quickly 
and otherwise it could grow with exponential speed. Uh, whether you're talking about cultural factor or governance styles, are these questions relevant in face of life and death? Actually, my guess is that the spread, we have, we're still at the early stages of this, by the way, um, because, you know, most people live in the developing world. Um, and so uh, and it, it's reached the developing world uh, later. Uh, you know, China, and then East Asia, and then Europe, and then the United States, North America, and so on. But it hasn't, you know, it's only now really uh, uh, taking hold in India, uh, and in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. And I think that, uh, you know, those figures that we've got at the moment are, I fear to say this, but I think maybe are only the first phase or first and second phase of what we're going to see. It's going to become, I think, very, very serious. How do you see the responsibilities government has played so far during this stage of COVID-19? I'm not saying the next stage, but this stage so far. Are they disappointing? Are they, should we be optimistic? Uh, uh, what can we expect? Can we expect them to change for the better? Uh, your assessment. Well, I think the word you use, disappointing, is the most accurate one. China uh, took drastic action and was, I think, brilliant uh, in that phase from uh, from the about around about the 23rd of January, the the, the, the lockdown in uh, in Wuhan and so on. But you've got to look at what the reaction in the West was. The reaction in the West to, during the course of January was basically to say about China. You know, you're covering up. Uh, it's all about secrecy. You're not being honest. You're not telling us. You know, you're not being honest with your own people. Uh, the government's only interested in its own survival. It's not interested in you know Chinese lives and so on. All this kind of thing. It really, it was aggressive. The response was very aggressive. It was a real anti-China assault in the course of January. I don't. We mustn't forget that or or or, or, or misunderstand that. It was like that. And. <laughs> The result of this, I think, essentially, was that people, uh, uh, the the government, government, the governing classes in the West, didn't think this could reach them, that it could affect them. They thought it was a Chinese problem, and they therefore totally misunderstood the significance of uh, coronavirus and thought that it was it was confined to a Chinese problem. They learned nothing. They had two months to, to prepare. They didn't prepare. The one great exception in the West, in my view, is Germany. Germany has done, it seems to me, an excellent job. It really thought about it, and it clearly learned from East Asia. It had watched East Asia. It had got uh, testing, uh, the, the necessary testing things together, and, and they've done a wonderful, relatively speaking, with it compared to the rest of the West, a wonderful job of testing and so on. But what this tells me is that, you know, the difficulty, the, the whole response to the pandemic has been colored by uh, the political uh, differences uh, to, or attitudes towards China uh, in the West, which have, which have seriously uh, uh, weakened the Western response. They didn't learn because they thought they would never be affected. And this was hubris. This was arrogance, you know, on the Western part. And we in the West and countries are paying a big price for this. Now, what we need in this situation is, you know, global cooperation. Now, I, w I would I would like to make one exemption to this. And that is, the, you don't hear the scientists in the UK, for example, criticizing China. You hear them saying, well, you know, they're, they're, they're abreast of a lot of the Chinese medical literature on, uh, on uh, COVID-19. Uh, they quote it. Uh, they seek to learn from this evidence. This is the kind of relationship. This sets an example, it seems to me, of what the relationship but it should be between countries and between medias and between national governments.